Findings from Strategic Pay's third annual pay equity analysis show the gender pay gap closed slightly this year, even while gender and ethnic pay gaps, when combined, still result in a whopping penalty of $17.6 billion, or 11% of wages and salaries. And perks for men had increased by more than for women. NBR's Dita Deboni spoke to Strategic Pay's Kathy Hendry for more detail about what the figures showed this year. Sure, so we found that the pay gap has reduced slightly this year. Um, and that's looking at, when we're looking at our pay gap, we're looking at it with um, both base salary and the benefits as well. So sort of a different to what the NZ stats would report. Um, and that was a surprise to us. Mm. Um, we were keen to see what was going to happen with um, all of the pay increases that were going on and also the impacts of COVID, whether females might have been um, negatively impacted. Um, but when we looked into it in more detail, what we did find was um, most of the re- reduction was actually within the public sector and the not-for-profit sector. Um, and those sectors have had um, quite um, dedicated sort of um, inputs into trying to reduce those gaps. So in the not-for-profit sector, we've got a lot of um, of those big pay equity settlements coming through, and those have had quite dramatic you know, changes. The, since we first started looking at it in 2020, those pay gaps have halved overall. Um, and then in the core public sector, of course, they've got a lot of... Um, emphasis from the government to have to actually um, publish their pay gaps and so we do think that that's actually having an impact there. So what can we take from this? I mean in terms of the private sector particularly they do seem to be lagging a bit. Um, where are the sort of the touch points in the in the private sector where you know they could easily improve their performance? Well, the thing that's really struck us about looking into into this analysis is where females and males are sitting in the sectors. So um, a lot of the pay gaps that we see, because we're grouping them all together, is, is due to where males and females sit in which sectors. And I was quite surprised to see that women were up underrepresented in the private sector at all levels. Um, and private sector is typically a high paying sector. Um, so the women are gravitating more towards the public sector, health sector, which are lower paying. They're doing a great job in terms of representation. But when you look at all of that data together, that is an issue. And saying that, when we look at private sector only, um, and by levels, we're still seeing pay gaps. And um, so there's going to be a bit, a bit of depending on which industries people are sitting in. So some industries will pay slightly differently even within the sectors. But even then, I don't think we'll be able to explain all of the gaps. So the lessons for us would be saying, you know, actually start looking. So start measuring your gaps and trying to understand what's going on and checking to see whether unconscious bias or or other things are impacting your pay decisions and look to try and address that. I mean, a lot of our readers say, you know, women have children, they take time out of the workforce, this is just a natural outcome of that, and I'm sure that that reason has been given many times by many people. What is the truth to that argument? There's some argument, and I, you know, I'll often sort of have people say, well, there's no such thing as a pay gap because of, um, like I say, women leaving the workforce, mm. and, and it's just they're choosing not to take those roles. Um, but then, you know, when you consider that men and women enter the workforce in equal proportions, you know, um, why do we say such a dramatic drop off? Mm. Um, and why aren't women being encouraged into these sectors that we know are well paying and we know that they can, can do it? But then also, um, when you actually look into it, you can't explain some of these gaps. Um, you know, our analysis looks at by by job size as well. And so we're saying comparable like for like, and yet there's still gaps. Mm. So I think there's a bit of, you know, and the work that I've done often, it's it's crept in over time. You can't remove organisations from society. And um, there's, you know, societal changes and pressures. Um, you know, there's arguments that men might go in and argue strongly when they enter a role, whereas women expect to see pay increases um, by showing that their proof is in the pudding. Right. Um, but the trouble is if you know you come in on a back foot, they don't necessarily correct that over time. Mm. Um, and so it sort of becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, 
so yeah, I think it's it's there's not a simple answer there, but there's mm. yeah there's it's and there is definitely a pay gap, and it's not just a case of women choosing to take break. Right. Um, there's there's more. There's not that same opportunities that you see for women versus men. That's yeah. really interesting. That might explain. Now, tell tell us about incentives. I noticed in this data, or I thought I noticed, that incentives for women have kind of dropped while they've gained for men over COVID. Is this because there's a shortage in the labour market and men come in with a much stronger um, set of demands, like you've just said? Yeah, it could be. They, they could be arguing harder. Um, you know, I've seen instances where... Uh, when you've got sort of discretionary payments um, that men might be better at negotiating and they right. might get better. Um, though there's been some studies to show that women um, ask just as much as men and don't necessarily get the same. So, mm, that's <laughs> you interesting. Know, that, that, yeah. yeah. Um, but then also I, I think it probably is speaking a little bit to, um, again, sector differences you know, we might see, over, we've seen recovery from COVID and we've seen some sectors recovering a lot stronger than others um, and greater demand and people putting out, you know, throwing out cash to try and keep staff. Um, and so that might be what's going on there. Potentially men might be more mobile, women might like security and so they might be saying, I'm going to leave if you don't get me more money. Right. Again, it's hard to say, but yeah. it's a really interesting outcome to see that difference yes. and you know like you say why why not sure but it's really fascinating to see a difference there and that has been exacerbated over COVID it seems to have yeah it seems to have increased yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it baffles the mind yeah. um <laughs> when you talk about incentives can you just sort of remind us what kind of things you you include in that oh yeah sure so when we're talking about incentives we're talking about at risk pay yeah, um, so it would be variable whether discretionary bonus or short-term incentives. Um, there's also, um, we also look at benefits. So as part of that analysis, we're looking at the types of perks or um, benefits on top of base salary that are offered, and that's things like car parking, um, cars or perk cars, health insurance, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, we're seeing gaps there as well. Um, interestingly, car, car parks overall have reduced and we think that's probably because people are working from home and they don't value it as a benefit anymore wow. you know yeah that's really interesting because that's a big benefit isn't it I mean traditionally has been for people mm. who work in the city yeah that's been a biggie that's right and seem to have been valued more for females than males so like last year when we looked at the analysis females actually received slightly more in terms of car parking than males and we thought you know they, they probably actually value that benefit if they're more likely to be the primary caregiver needing to pop out of work to pick up kids yes. um, they're not going to necessarily meet the early bird car parking so the car parks is right. probably a real perk for them yeah 